All right, you guys. Well, welcome. My name is Lori Joyner, and you're here with the Connected Bible Study. And this week, we're talking about freedom in your identity in Christ. I mean, there are so many things we could talk about when it comes to freedom and identity in Christ. And today, we're going to put those together before we jump into our actual chapter on embracing your identity in Christ found in the Next Steps Bible Study. And if you don't have a copy of this, if you're new, or if somebody sent you this video and you would like to have this workbook, you can just go to lorijoinerministries.org and order yourself one, all right? So freedom and your identity in Christ. What does freedom mean to you? I mean, freedom has a deep meaning to me, as in both sides of my family, there are war veterans. My grandfather on my dad's side, Robert Burns Fleener, flew dive bombers in World War II. He was in the first squadron to fly and land on Guadalcanal as a retaliation of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. On my mother's side, we've been able to trace our lineage back to John McCutcheon. He was born in 1739 and he fought in the Revolutionary War, also known as the American War of Independence against Great Britain, to free us and the colonies from the control of the crown in Great Britain. So the fact that in my heritage is men who fought to bring the U.S. freedom that it now enjoys to this day and defend that freedom over the years makes me very proud. I mean, I love the fact that the blood of fighters runs through my veins. But today I'm going to talk about a different type of freedom. The freedom we receive when we embrace our identity in Christ. We will see today that because of our identity in Christ, we are free from performance-based living. We're free from the authority of Satan. We're free from the mistakes of our past, and we're freed up to cheer others on. So let's jump in. We're going to be reading from the book of Colossians this afternoon. Let me pray and let's get going. Lord Jesus, I thank you for every woman on the screen today and all those that will listen to this talk later. Father, I pray that they would know their salvation found in you is secure and their worth that's found in you will never change. I thank you, Lord, that when we placed our faith in you, you gave us a new identity and we can embrace that identity. So Lord, I pray that I would get out of the way and that you would speak through me. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So in the book of uh, Colossians, as you're turning there, um, I want to let you know that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote this letter. What does apostle mean? It just means sent one. He was sent to others to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And he's writing a letter to the people in Colossae. Matter of fact, he'd never been there. Somebody else had established that church. He had heard about this church's great faith in this town, Colossae, so they're called Colossians. And he decided to write them a letter while he was in prison preaching about Christ. Now, you got to understand, Paul lived in a cancel culture. Did you know that? Ah, I can pull in a little buzzword right here. But Paul was living in a cancel culture. The religious leaders of the time did not like that he preached Jesus Christ had been crucified at their hand, risen from the dead, and arose to heaven. Oh, they didn't like that. No, no, no. It threatened their narrative. <laughs> it threatened their control. So what did they do? They had to shut the man up. So they stuck him in prison. Thankfully, he still had his right <laughs> to write. And that's what we have. Most of the New Testament now is him being stuck in prison because they didn't like what he was saying with his mouth. I promise you, if he had Twitter or Facebook, they would have been canceled because he was preaching something that the people did not like and they didn't want to hear it. So he's in prison, but he hears about the great faith of the Colossians. So he says, I've got to write them and just connect with them at least that way. So like I said, he'd never been to Colossae, but he's written them a letter. I want to start in chapter one, verse nine. Paul says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, her, who's the we? It's him and Timothy. Timothy's his disciple in the faith. Since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you to fill, uh, praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will 
through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have, you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness for sins. I mean, there are so many great lessons that I could speak to you about just in those verses. It's like packed full of greatness. But today, I really want to give our attention to how this relates to our identity in Christ. So look back with me at just verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you. Circle the word or underline the word qualified. That's a pivotal word in this chapter that I want you to understand. This qualification happened at the moment you trusted Christ. When we trust Christ, we make an exchange. Our sin for his righteousness. Our sin was poured onto Christ at his crucifixion. His righteousness is poured into us at conversion. At the moment we trust Christ as Savior and Lord. And at that moment, we are cut loose and free from performance-based living. Okay, so we're in point number one. We're free from performance-based living. He says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified me or qualified you. I didn't do it. He did it. He did it when he died for me. He qualified me to be saved. I cannot add anything to the work he did on the cross. I simply, he says, need to be thankful for it. All striving to be something great in God's eyes or in other people's eyes is over. I'm, I'm qualified. It's done. It's like taking a test that you pass. You're now qualified. You no longer need to keep taking the test. The test is over. When I became a group fitness instructor at the YMCA, I had to study for six months a huge course workbook. I literally told my friends, I feel like I'm studying to become a nurse. It was tons of anatomy and physiology. I had to know about the pulmonary system, the cardiovascular system, the nervous system, the pulmonary system. I mean, I had to make sure I could work you out in the cold, in the heat, if you were old, if you were young. We had to make sure that as group fitness instructors, we took some type of test so that when I got up on stage, I didn't injure people, but I helped them. I took the test one day. It was like taking the SAT. I showed up, my desk was assigned, my, my pamphlet already had my social security number on it. And I took an extremely long timed test to make sure that I would not hurt the public, but I passed the test. I'm now qualified to be a group fitness instructor. I no longer need to strive to pass the test. It happened, but let me be very clear here. Christ took the ultimate test for us. He endured the cross and we reap the benefits of salvation. So yes, Paul's right. Thankfulness is in order, but just as salvation is based on Christ, so is my worth from that point on. Having my identity in Christ means that I need not strive to find my worth or my qualification in anything but Christ alone. What are you striving to find worth in? Being the best mom on the block, bringing the best snacks to the team meeting, being the best friend in your group, the one everybody really turns to being the go-to person at work, being the most organized in your family, being the best cook, the daughter that does most the work. It's not wrong to strive for excellence, but it's pointless to find your worth in anything other than being a daughter of the king of the universe. 
No longer is your identity based on performance and striving, but on what Christ has done for you. So let go. Let go of striving for worth. Be okay. Be grateful. For God has called you qualified. You are his and that is enough. Not only are we freed from performance-based living, but we're free from the authority of Satan. Let's look at verse 13. It says, for he, talking about Christ, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Look at that phrase, dominion of darkness. It can also be translated power or authority. So why don't you circle that in your Bible? Power, authority, dominion, depending on your translation. Before you became a Christian, you belonged to Satan's kingdom. He is the king of the air. He's the king of this world. You were under his domain. That's what the Bible calls being a slave to sin. But when you became a Christian, you were transported into the kingdom of Christ. You are no longer in Satan's kingdom and no longer his authority. The only authority Satan has to operate in your life is the authority you give him. Okay, we can no longer say the devil made me do it. No, ma'am. We allowed it. We allowed it. <laughs> Back to verse 13, it says, we wonder, how does he rescue us? He rescued us from the dominion of darkness, brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption. That redemption is by his blood. When he died and his blood was shed on the cross, he was fulfilling and thus doing away with the Old Testament sacrificial system of animals having to die for people's sins. When Christ redeemed us with his blood, we were rescued. We were set free from the authority of Satan. We're now in the kingdom of Jesus. You know, I love the way that Jesus said this to Paul in Acts 26, 15 through 18. See, Paul was traveling to persecute Christians, yet on the road, God spoke to him about this very issue of being transported from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Let's read that. Acts 26, 15 through 18. Once you jot that on your notes, Acts 26, 15 through 18. So he's on the road. A light shines around Paul and Paul said, who are you, Lord? And it says, I am Jesus who you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I've appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. When you are tempted to give in to sin or an old pattern of behavior, an old thought pattern about your worth, remind yourself that you are free from Satan's control. You don't have to sin. You don't have to give in to the temptation you are not a slave. You are God's. Further, with your identity firmly in Christ, we can be these people reaching out in the name of Christ and helping them pack up and move to the kingdom of light. So not only are we no longer under the authority of Satan, but we're freed from the mistakes we made while we were there. Let's read verse 14 in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Having my identity in Christ means I'm not defined by my past, by my past mistakes, by the mistakes others made on me, not defined by my childhood, not defined by my regrets. They no longer have power over me because I have been forgiven. The word forgive literally means to place away. 
When you become a believer, your sins are placed away from you. You're forgiven. I love the Old Testament illustration and teaching on this subject. I love the illustration of the scapegoat. Check this out. On the Day of Atonement, which is the most important holiday on the Jewish calendar, two goats are necessary to make the sacrifice. This is in Old Testament times. The one goat, the high priest would whisper over naming the sins of the nation. And that scapegoat was taken out into the wilderness, driven away from the camp of the Hebrews so far that the goat could never find its way back to the people. The other goat was killed, all right? The other goat's blood was shed. The message that was acted out on that day each year was a symbol and a foreshadowing of what Christ did for us on the cross. He took our sins away and his blood was shed for us. You know, Satan would love for you and I to see ourselves through the lens of our old identity and our sins. But the moment you start to live for God and help others be transported from the kingdom of darkness into God's kingdom, Satan will throw your old life and your old identity back in your face. He loves to point back to our old life and say, why, who are you to be talking to people about Jesus? You're not anything. You're a drunk. You're in rehab. You're a liar. You are a gossip. You're an adulteress. You're a fraud. You're a cheat. You've been abused and used. You can't be forgiven. That one, that one thing, that was too big. You're mean. You're fill in the blank. At this point, you must say and embrace and take hold of your freedom. You say, I am saved. I'm redeemed. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. I am a daughter of God. And that trumps all other old labels and past sins. Listen, you may have to say this to yourself a thousand times over and to Satan. You might have to say it until you really embrace it and find freedom in it. All right. You might have to say it until you believe it deeply in your heart because it's truth. But sometimes those old habits are so big, they almost feel like an avalanche. Those old sins creep up in our mind and we have to really combat them with the truth of scripture. And when our identity is in Christ, I no longer compete with others. Matter of fact, I'm freed up to cheer others on in Christ. Let's look again at verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. I want to pick this apart a little bit to share in the inheritance of the saints. We will share in the inheritance, that is, the kingdom treasures that belong to believers. We are his saints and we will share. We are his holy people, not by our actions, but because of his blood. Now, we've got to stop here and understand what a saint is because it's pivotal. Circle the word saint or underline the word saint. What am I talking about here? Do you think Paul's saying that this inheritance in the kingdom of God is only for a select few saints that are like super holy people that might have already died? That can't be what it means because that's not even in the context of scripture. He's writing to all the believers in Colossae. He's writing to all of them. So it can't mean just a few select people. Paul not only was writing to the Colossians, he was writing to Christians at large through all time. The word saint comes from the Greek word hagios, which means consecrated to God, holy, sacred. It is almost always used in the plural, saints. For example, Acts 9.13. In, uh, in that passage, it says, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, speaking about Paul, and how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. Talking about a big group of people there. 
Also in Acts 9.32, now as Peter was traveling through all these regions, he came down also to the saints who lived in Lydda. Okay, there's a lot of people living there. And this is just, okay, this is Acts 26.10. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, on he goes. Again, saints, many, many people were locked up in a prison because they were preaching the gospel. There's only one instance in all of scripture where it's used in a singular uh, use, and that is greet every saint in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.21. All right, he's writing to the people in Philippians there. So understand that scripturally speaking, saints are the large body of Christ, all Christians, the entire church Christendom. All Christians are considered saints. Christians are saints by virtue of their connection with Jesus Christ. Christians are called to be saints as well. We should be increasingly allowing our daily life to more closely match my position in Christ as a daughter of his. So this is not a select group of people that are like uber holy. This is you and me. He's talking to us. So verse 12 says, we will share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. We will share with others. They will have an inheritance in the kingdom of God because they're a saint. They place their faith in Christ. They have a connection to Jesus. And I will get a part of that too. So there's no competition. We're both going to be there. We're both going to enjoy that. When I'm secure in my identity in Christ, I can cheer others on. I think about Alejandra and all she does for the Lord in her bilingual Bible teaching. When my identity is in Christ, I don't have to be jealous of her that she speaks two languages and that she's this awesome Bible teacher. I can just cheer her on. Yay, we're both going to be there. We're both saints. We're both going to be there. When my identity is in Christ, I know I'm, in, I'm his beloved daughter. Then I can cheer on Michelle Perzan and her ministry and her two books that she's published and all of her speaking engagements. When I'm secure in Christ, I can cheer on anybody in any realm. I can be happy for other popular instructors at the YMCA. I can be cheering on people that are great at many different things in their lives, at work, in the neighborhood. I can be secure because I know that God has given me gifts, talents, and abilities that I'm going to try to use to the best of my ability. When we feel competitive with others, they may be in your place of work, your neighborhood, even in your family. We must hold these thoughts captive. And remember, our worth comes from Christ, not in beating somebody else out and trying to be holy. God calls me a saint. I will share in the inheritance. I don't have to drive myself into the ground being the best and competing with everyone or even other believers. You know, when I think back to the freedom fighters in my family, I'm so happy. I mean, I'm truly thrilled to know that their blood runs through my veins. But I'm even more grateful for the blood of Christ. By his blood, I am freed up from performance-based living. I'm free from the authority of Satan. I'm free from my mistakes of the past and I'm freed up to cheer others on. My identity is in Christ. I'm a child of God. I'm a branch on the true vine. I'm accepted and I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for your solid biblical teaching in this topic. And I loved looking at it, studying it, and dreaming about what I might say to my other sisters in Christ on this Zoom call. Father, I pray that as we move into our small group time, that you would continue to speak to our hearts. Convict us where we're trying to find our worth in something else. Father, I pray for anybody on here that maybe has never placed their faith in you personally. I pray that today would be the day when they fall to their knees and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life that I trust you as my Lord and Savior. Lord, I thank you that you drew me to do that at age 16 and you've made me the woman you've meant for me to be. Thank you that my worth is not in books. It's not in speaking. It's not in being a wife or a mom. My, my ultimate worth is what you've given me as worth. What you did on the cross as you brought me and bought me 
into the kingdom of light. So we say we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys. Well, let me stop our recording here, and then we're going to move on into our small groups. Let me see here. Here we go.